brings up Dr. Ross's review. He's up for assistant attending in surgery. What does the staff want to recommend to the board? Well, the chief of staff goes along with the chief of surgery. He's uh, had the best chance to observe Ross. Dr. Anderson? I'd say give him the green light. He's done very well. He's got a good pair of hands if he... Well, never mind. I'm confident he can handle the responsibility. I'd say the committee recommends that Dr. James Ross be given the privileges of an assistant attending in surgery. Does the administration have any comment on Dr. Ross? I think we've made a good addition to the staff. We need good young men for the future. I'll see that it's brought to the board. This is a hospital in operation. It's not the usual scene most people picture, scurrying nurses, busy doctors, patients undergoing some crisis. No, this is a part of what makes those other scenes possible. For this is a part of the administration of a hospital. The cooperative interplay between a medical staff, an administrator, and the hospital board, each of which plays a vital role in this complex organization charged with the problems of providing the best inpatient care in accord with the principles of accreditation. In a short while, this hospital, or one very much like it, may be your hospital. You may be a member of its staff, working with its administrator, complying with the regulations of the medical staff and board. And it will not always be easy. You may face some of the same problems as young Dr. James Ross, whose name has just come up here before this staff committee. You may experience some of the same feelings perhaps be faced with the same decision. When you are in Dr. Ross's shoes, which path will you take? What will you decide? troubles. I'll say we have, Dr. Ross. Ruptured? The appendix is all right. There's a different lesion. Carcinoma. Want to start closing him up? Might as well. No. Break open the resection instrument. You're going ahead? We're going ahead. I said break open the resection instrument. But doctor, would you want to be closed up with something like that in you? We're going ahead. Have the lab cross match two units, stat. How's his blood pressure holding? It's okay. I'm gonna have to have him in deeper. I think you better get Dr. Anderson in here. I'm not clear to assist on a resection. Yes, I think the chief should be here. the ureter on that side, Dr. Ross? I have. Proceed. Dr. Anderson? Hmm? Okay. Wow, 
I thought the sparks would set off the anesthetic. Yeah, and if I know the chief, the fireworks haven't even started yet. What happened in here, for heaven's sake? Well, Dr. Ross, on his own, decided to switch from an appendectomy to a bowel resection. It was Dr. Cole who sent for Dr. Anderson. Oh. I hoped I'd find you still around somewhere. I just wanted to tell you what a fine job you did on the resection. Pity you started it before I was called. You mean it's a pity I didn't botch the job, because that takes the sting out of the lecture you're gonna give me. Am I? Well, isn't that what you're leading up to? I scheduled an appendectomy and found out it should have been a resection. Crime number one. Then, instead of wringing my hands and running to you to find out what to do, I did what any self-respecting doctor ought to do. I went ahead with the resection. Crime two, proceeding without authority. And the biggest crime in the book. Well, I don't deny it. I just... I... Hold on. Let's take the so-called crimes, as you call them, one at a time. You scheduled a simple appendectomy. On what basis? The facts, the history, the physical, the blood count. They were all indicative of an acute abdominal condition. Did the patient have any anemia? Hemoglobin was 10 and a half grams. What was the white count? 15,000 with 82% poly. Did you feel any masses on his physical? No, no masses. Any history of rectal bleeding? Occult blood? No. Don't you think I'd have been alerted by something like that? There was nothing. Any weight loss? No. How about recurrent attacks of constipation, anorexia, change in bowel habits? No, no, no. There was nothing to indicate anything more serious than acute appendicitis. You can read it all in the record. The records are up to date then. Well, uh... Well, I can certainly bring them up to date if it makes the slightest bit of difference. But I don't think it does. I think you know that I was justified in opening up the patient for an appendectomy. Well, then crime number one, quote, unquote, is no crime at all. Then you mean to tell me you've got me up here on the carpet simply for overstepping the privileges that a bunch of laymen on a board see fit to allow me? Or is this just your way of telling me that you're chief of surgery and I'm one of the low men on the totem pole? <laughs> you're wondering what kind of a man I am, aren't you? Well, I'll tell you. I'm a pretty good doctor who knows another good doctor when he sees one. Or what will be a good doctor when he gives himself a chance to understand some things. Understand? Well, you just as much as said that I understood what was best for my patient. Oh, no. That's medical skill. I agree, you've got that. But you're a long way from understanding how a hospital works. Some of the whys and wherefores of the rules around here. Now comes the lecture. I should love the rules. You sure remind me of someone. A jackass, I suppose. <laughs> Have it your own way. No, you remind me of another doctor I knew when I was younger. About the time I got married. Oh, you were surprised that I can remember when I was young? Oh, I know what they say about me in the doctor's dressing room. I'm a flinty old tyrant who was born with a surgical knife for a hand, a medical dictionary for a brain, and nothing at all for a heart. No, 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 no. Don't deny it. It's true. I am mostly medicine. And I propose to give you some of my brand of medicine right now if it will help you understand your responsibilities as a physician. Okay, Dr. Anderson, you just tell me what it is that I seem to need to know. You need to get it through your head that this hospital and every other one like it 
is run for the benefit of the community and not for the exclusive comfort and convenience of the doctors. This is a community hospital. Is it so hard to believe that laymen, as members of the governing board, could concern themselves with the welfare of patients? It's not that. It's just that laymen don't know enough about medicine to lay down the rules under which it should be practiced. And I don't know what makes them think they do. That is where you are dead wrong. They don't think so. Regulating medicine is a job for medicine. The board knows that and insists that the rules originate with us. The staff recommends them. The board adopts them and sees that they're enforced through the administrator. All right. If the doctors make the rules, then why is it that nine times out of ten, the rules hamstring the doctors? Because ten times out of ten, they protect the patients. Well, I can't believe that a doctor needs outside interference to protect his patients. Well, maybe I better tell you about that other doctor. The one you reminded me of a minute ago. His name was... Well, never mind. Let's just call him Dr. A. Exhibit A. Dr. A was a young fellow, too. Just starting into private practice with the restrictions of medical school and internship behind him. On his own at last, feeling like a king. He looked at his first hospital as just a part of his kingdom, and he came to it feeling that he had the keys to the kingdom in his hands. Dr. A's first run-in with the facts of life came when he introduced himself to the hospital administrator and found that even a king has to have a passport, that he had to make out an application for membership on the staff, and what's more, had to have that application approved by a bunch of laymen. His application was approved, as he knew it would be, but with a rather pointed barb to show him that his kingdom was going to be a limited monarchy. According to the medical staff bylaws, as approved by the governing board, you will serve a probationary period of six months duration, in which your privileges will be limited as follows. Ha! <laughs> what a bunch of malarkey. They were condescending to let him practice about as much medicine as a junior house officer, and he was supposed to be grateful about that. Grateful? Ha! <laughs> well... Actually, he should have been. There was a good reason for his having to make a formal application and serve a period of probation. No quack or incompetent is going to make it through a screening like that. And the doctor who takes pride in his profession is grateful for it. He knows it's not him they're trying to keep out, but the guy who doesn't know a fistula from a fibula without a medical dictionary. <laughs> okay, Chief, I get the picture. I'll buy what you're trying to sell me, that the probationary rule is a good rule. In fact, I may even be able to get the chip off my shoulder long enough to prove to you that I can make it. That isn't all I'm trying to sell you, Jim. I'm trying to sell you the whole bill. How long has it been since we've seen you at a medical staff meeting? Well, I don't know. Not long. But I've got patients to take care of. And there are always emergencies cropping up. I want to practice medicine, not professional politics. And my wife would like to see me sometimes. Staff meetings and committee falderal can eat into your time until there's very little left for people who are sick. Now, how does the hospital, if it's so dedicated to patients, justify mandatory attendance that keeps you away from them? Simple. It doesn't. If you've actually got an emergency case, you're excused. But if you're using non-emergency patients as an excuse to escape your responsibilities to the health of the community, you're not. I... Now, before you rupture a blood vessel, maybe we'd better get back to Dr. A. I think we'd be on safer ground. <sighs> Dr. A gave scant attention to medical staff meetings and avoided committee appointments like the plague until the winter of the flu epidemic. Like every other doctor in town, he was up against it 24 hours a day. But unlike the other doctors who'd showed up for an educational staff meeting before the flu hit, he wasn't up on the latest ways to cope with the complications. The hospital was desperately short-staffed. Nurses and other hospital workers get the flu, too. And maybe Dr. A had occasion to regret not offering to serve on a committee set up to train volunteer health workers. At any rate, 
After that, he did start showing up at the staff meetings, and eventually even took over one of the classes teaching volunteer workers. But although he was coming around a little, Dr. A was still far from tolerant of rules and regulations. I'll never forget the time he bucked up against the admitting officer. She'd called him to report that according to hospital rules, she couldn't admit one of his patients. But doctor, the man is violent. The ambulance attendants are having to restrain him. We can't admit psychotics. My dear lady, when you show me your license to practice medicine, I'll invite your consultation on a diagnosis. That man has meningitis. And I want him admitted to this hospital as fast as you can get him in here. Now get a move on. What was that all about? How am I supposed to know that a raving maniac isn't a psycho? He should have called me to tell me what was wrong with the patient before he sent him out. Third floor, please. She was right, of course. And for a doctor to ride roughshod over hospital employees puts an unnecessary strain on the people who serve two masters, the hospital that hires them and the doctors who issue the orders. Dr. A didn't want to see the fairness of a rule made to protect patients from cases the hospital might not be able to cope with. At first, he was too busy with the meningitis victim, and after that, he was too mad. He had a way of flipping his thumb when he'd run up against something that frustrated him. Sort of the way you light a kitchen match. And from the way his thumb was flipping that night, you'd think he was ready to light a fire under the whole hospital, particularly if the administrator and the board were in the building. He got over it in time. The meningitis case was none the worse for the delay in admission, but there were still plenty of other burrs under his saddle. Those medical records, for instance. I see that rings a bell with you, too. Well, don't tell me it doesn't ring one with you. If they didn't stuff so many file cases full of paperwork they'd dream up for doctors to do, they'd have room for five more beds in here, I swear it. I think even you'll admit that a hospital is more than beds. Beds they got at home. It's care they come here for, and you can't have good care, or even adequate care without complete records. Oh, sure. Every line on a record sheet saves a life. Bunk. Every line you write in a record contributes to medical knowledge, which is supposed to be a pretty good thing. But haven't you ever come across a situation where a record had some immediate consequence for the patient? Not that I can think of. Oh, don't be so bullheaded. You never heard of a severe reaction because some dunderhead forgot to note a sensitivity to penicillin? Well... Sure you have, but that was somebody else's goof-off, wasn't it? The records you're supposed to keep never put some other poor devil on the spot, do they? Oh, doctors are human. Precisely. And that's why the ogres on the board, the administrator, and the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Hospitals insist on complete records to protect patients from the very humanness of men who are more human than most because they devote their lives to serving other people. I can see that you, I mean this Dr. A, probably spent plenty of time keeping records. Now, is that what you expect me to do? I don't know what I'd expect you to do. If I had a son, I'd... If you were the son I once hoped to have, I'd wish that you could sincerely stand behind this institution and its efforts the way it stands behind you and your efforts. I... I take it I've been stabbing my benefactor in the back. Well, let's take that bleeding ulcer case you had a few weeks ago. Your patient used two or three pints of blood, as I remember. Blood his friends and relatives were supposed to replace. But that was too big a bother. They just wanted to pay for it. Now, you know as well as I do that this hospital can't transfuse dollars. And when you backed your patient up in wanting to put dollars into a blood bank, you were undercutting the hospital in his eyes, making it look like an unreasonable place, when it was completely reasonable in looking out for the next fellow that needed blood. You expect this hospital to understand your dedication to the sick. I say there's a case for understanding on both sides. Well, so I was wrong that time. Well, now aren't you big to admit it? as if that were the only time. Young man, you've got a whole lot to learn. You can thank your lucky stars if you don't have to learn it the way I... Dr. A learned it. He was out in the yard when the call came from Betsy, the wife of one of his friends. Hello? Oh, hello, 
Betsy. How's my favorite fat lady today? I don't know whether I'm about to become a thin lady or not. I've had a lulu of a pain. Low down. Well, go away. Wouldn't you know it when George is out of town? I'm scared. I've got the most awful feeling that something terrible is going to happen. Sounds just like a girl about to have her first one. <laughs> you say George isn't there tonight. And then we'd better get you out to the hospital for observation. I was going out anyway. I'll come by for you. I'll see you in... Uh, six minutes, okay? And don't worry. Goodbye. supposed to have on my white coat or it's not official. Have you been feeling all right up to now? Great. Only right now I've got a splitting headache. Probably nerves. Let's see. I saw you just 10 days ago, didn't I? And then I don't think we have to give you a physical tonight. We can do that in the morning. Now, I know you've been in good hands and a good night's rest may be all you need. A friend he knew for whom he wanted to make things as easy as possible. And so he ignored a red tape stipulation that every OB had to have a physical examination upon admission. As for the sense of doom and the headache Betsy had complained of, not worth noticing. Any more than he noticed that the pain, which was continuous and severe, was localized in the lower abdomen. I'm going home now. I'll see you in the morning. The things a physical examination could have told Dr. A about Betsy's condition, the extremely high blood pressure, a marked weight gain, albumin in the urine, could have prepared him for what happened. Yes, doctor? Your patient is not acting normally. I think you'd better get here right away. I'll be right there. <gasps> Eclampsia. Got some weight. <laughs> Oxygen. MS a quarter and, and 10 grams of 50% bag sulfate. It's all right, I'm here now. It's all right. I'm going to be all right now. How many convulsions has she had? Five, I think. They came so fast. I'm afraid we're going to lose her. We're not. We're not going to lose anybody. But he did lose her. He lost her and the baby. And it taught him for all time that no requirement which reflects good medical practice is to be taken lightly or ignored. I'm sorry, Dr. A for Anderson. A for Anderson? It was A for Alcott. What made you think? Oh, the thumb. Hm. Must have picked that up from him. Well, why not? We were as close as brothers. Shared the same office. He was my friend. Friend? Then Betsy and the baby? 
My wife and my son. Had a hell of a time with Alcott. You want to give up practicing, crazy fool. I should have kept a closer eye on her. Talk about a shoemaker's kids going barefoot. And they wonder in the dressing room why you bury yourself in medicine. You tell them and I'll have your head on a platter. I want respect for my authority as chief of service, not a bunch of slobbering sentimentality. Now, go on home. Or go up in the operating room and do another resection and try to get by with it. You've had all the medicine you're gonna get from me today. Thanks, Chief. I think I've had all I'm ever gonna need. Cup of coffee? Sure. Why not? 